Okay, so welcome back. We have Steve Freeman here with us. He's a distinguished consultant in Zulki Group and also one of the pioneers uh, of Agile in the UK. Uh, today he will try and solve the problem of uh, tension between uh, product and development. And so, Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll try and keep it. it. It's very easy in this room with, with, with all the dark. To th everyone just goes to sleep. So I'll try and keep it moving. Um, this is um, some joint work with, that I did with, or that I've been doing with an occasional colleague of mine called Chris Matz, um, based in London. And it's about the problem that, so I'm assuming, I'm talking as a technical person, and it's about the problem that we regularly face, which is, you know, we're looking at this, co this system and the code, and it's all really just horrible, and there's a whole bunch of things we want to fix. Um, and we keep moaning about it, and on the business, whatever, the, the other side, because there's a, it's treated as another side, um, they, they, they're not interested. It's not a problem for them. They have lots of other problems to deal with. Um, this is not their concern. Um, and so it never gets prioritized. And this is how we look. Um, you know, we're we, we just sort of a bunch of moaners, and we don't really understand the real world and all this kind of stuff. Um, so this is the, the fundamental thing. How do we get the point across, or what are ways of getting, and ways of getting the point across that um, will attract the right kind of attention? But before I go into this, I wanted to talk a little bit about what, what technical debt even means. And the way it's commonly understood, talked about now, is in terms of bad code. Um, and it wasn't the original intention, but everyone talks about it now this, this way. Um, and I think that's a mistake because bad code is, is a different problem. Uh, well, maybe it's, it's a related problem, but um, bad code we should just fix at some level. Um, there's questions about how you do that. But there's a more interesting definition of technical debt, which is, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's a long quote, so I'll read it out. Uh, so, how many people know about Wall Cunningham? Know who Wall Cunningham is? How many people know about the wiki? Wikipedia, all that stuff? Yeah? So, Wall Cunningham is amongst as many um, whatever qualifications or whatever is the, the, the chap who wrote the first wiki. And he's got a number of significant innovations. Um, a lot of stuff you've heard about can be traced back to Walt Cunningham, um, but not really knows that. So Walt Cunningham says, I'm never in favor, and, and he came up with the term technical debt. Um, I'm never in favor of writing code poorly, but I am in favor of writing code to reflect your current understanding of a problem, even if that understanding is partial. In other words, the whole debt metaphor, let's say the ability to pay back debt and make the debt metaphor work for your advantage, depends on your writing code that is clean enough to be able to refactor as you come to understand uh, your problem. Um, and I come back to this, but, but the purpose of the debt metaphor was to find a way of talking to business side people uh, in a way that was useful. And debt is, a, I'll come back to this again, debt is a useful tool as long as you control it and it doesn't control you. But what this says, another way of looking at this is, this is another old timer, a chap called Dick Gabriel. Um, it talks about habitability, and habitability, habitability is where the developers can place their hands on any item without having to think too deeply about where it is. And you go to the code and you just look. Um, and if you think about, you know, you go to the kitchen, you go to your kitchen, and you know where the knives are, and you know where the coffee is, and the milk, and the fridge, and all that kind of stuff, and you can read the kitchen, you know where to go. Um, and there's a colleague of mine many, many years ago got dropped on a project for three days. He says, look, we're, we're, we're behind on this project. You've got three days free. Go and work on that. Really? So he sat at his desk. What shall I do? Well, I have, here's my task. And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to need one of these. Oh, here it is. And I'm going to have to connect it to one of these. Oh, here it is. And this is how I connect it. And this is, and he says, it's the most productive code base he's ever worked on because everything was just in the right place. Now, the dark side of that story is the way that happened was there was one guy who, if you ever tried to name anything, would sit on your head until it was perfectly named. Um, 
and was perfectly structured. And the problem was everybody hated this guy, but it was effective for the code. But what this says, if you go back to the kitchen, is that technical debt is not about that you, you, know, you find the milk in the oven, but it's about finding that you've got people coming around for dinner and you need to buy a bigger pan. It's like the circumstances have changed and now you're in a different situation. What this also says is that technical debt is a socio-technical problem um, because habitability is, a both about, is both about the code and the people who are working with it. Because you can have a horrible mess, but if everybody just knows where everything is, that's kind of habitable. Um, and it's just like most of us, I imagine, could walk into any modern kitchen and kind of figure it out pretty quickly where, where, the, you know, where the knives are and where, where the fridge is. Um, because we've learned, because it's, had, it, it's a consistent, habitable environment. Um, if you were brought up as a nomad, you know, living in tents or something, I and you, they stick you in this room full of cupboards, you wouldn't know necessarily what, know what to do. Um, and what this says is, is kind of interesting, because what this says is that if you have what you think is an excellent project, you know, with all the latest patterns and goodness and the rest of it, and it gets handed off suddenly to a team that has no idea how this is, what, what this stuff means, all of a sudden that, that project has, in some sense, has technical debt, because it's not habitable for the team that has to work for it. Why do we care? Why are we using technical debt? A thing is because it introduces, amongst the other reasons, it introduces uncertainty. So when the model and the code doesn't match the world that it operates in, we have to work harder to bridge the two. Now that might be an unplanned rework because all of a sudden, uh, by the way, you know we have to get this to work in two time zones and you didn't plan for that. Um, or by writing ugly, ugly brittle, bridging code to get from one to the other. And that's what most people do, I think. So when you look at unpleasant code bases, it's mostly because it's stretched between multiple models. And then people write really nasty hacks to get from one to the other. And the reason it, the uncertainty makes it harder for the people to depend on us, or for us to make promises to the people who depend on us to, to, to deliver. I think there's another one, another sort of another level up, which is in terms of team demotivation is that it's harder to stay focused and enthusiastic when every day you're dealing with this, this mess, this brokenness, working around brokenness that you just can't fix. Um, and eventually you, you lose all your good people. Um, and what this says is that technical debt is actually a product owner issue, even though they may not think of it. Because if you think about what the purpose of debt is to balance long-term and short-term priorities. So I take, I take on debt so I can get something now, knowing that in the longer term I'm going to have to deal with it, um, because for whatever reason it, it seems like a good idea. If the product owners have to delegate those trade-offs to the technical stories without understanding value, then part of their job, and their job is to prioritize, um, is they're, not, they're no longer doing it, or they've lost control of part of their job. And that might mean that they're, making, they're not making the best decisions because a significant part of their budget, if you like, has, is now out of their control. Now, there is a counter problem, which is where you have product owners that don't understand the system they're working with and they don't understand these issues, and they never like, you know, um, which is kind of what drives our, a lot of our frustrations. And effectively what they're doing is driving the system into a ditch. Now that's an important but different problem. Um, but the risk for us as technical people is that if we say this is a technical problem, here's our technical budget, da 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 da, -da um, we will lose because we don't have the budget. We, you know, we're always on the wrong side of history if we do that. And so if we only talk in, term, in these sort of terms, eventually that, that budget will get squeezed out. There will be a crisis or something. Something else will become more important. So the way, the conventional way of talking about technical debt, I just realized, how many people are actually familiar with the term technical debt? <laughs> are we, so I'm kind of assuming you know, um, no problem. Um, and the way, the standard way of talking about technical debt, the way, the way Ward originally framed it, is like a credit card debt. You have a principal, which is the amount that you borrowed, and then regular interest payments, and then the interest payments can be compounding, all that kind of stuff stuff you get from your bank. 
And everybody know, you know, the, the way you talk about it is that if the debt gets too big and interest payments get too big, then eventually your code goes bankrupt. Um, and I have seen that the um, many years ago when I was freelance, and I'd, I'd go to two, several companies a row where um, it's kind of weird out-of-body experience, where development was in Europe, testing was in India, and product was in America. And they had both had 10, 15-year-old C++ code bases that were just awful, uh, because for 10 years they'd just been jamming new features in as fast as possible, and now they couldn't change anything. And the competitors were beginning to come up and challenge them, and they were stuck. They'd run out of time. So you can go bankrupt on your code base. Um, and it turns out that you can pay consultancies and they will give you a value of your technical debt down to two decimal places, which is really quite impressive, um, if you believe that. Um, but the trouble with this sort of co this kind of code base analysis, you know, and they run a they run a checking tool over and it looks for complexity and assorted uh, debt things, you know, plug in plug into Sonar. But the trouble with the sort of static view of technical debt is it doesn't, it's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily reflect reality. So consider, you have two components. You have a red component, and your, your tool says the red, red component is absolutely packed full of technical debt. It's just horrible. Uh, whereas the green component over here is not bad. And if you take a static view, it would say, go and fix the red component. However, the red component hasn't changed in five years, and it's not going to change. And you know, it's going to be retired in a year's time. No one's ever going to fix it. Whereas the green component is changing all the time, which is why it's probably green. It's probably relatively clean. If we paid down the debt based on the sort of flat measurement, we'd be looking at the wrong, looking at the wrong component. And in fact, if you look at an awful lot of standard, very very popular open source libraries. Um, frameworks, the best thing to do is not look inside. I think a, lot, a lot of them fit clearly in the red, compo the red component area um, because for all sorts of reasons. And you know, on the whole, you don't, you don't patch those things. You just take the latest release. Um, so that's one problem. The other problem with debt uh, in terms of credit cards is my experience is that technical debt is not linear. So, again, Ward's intention was to, to categorize technical problems or, or mismatches um, in financial terms so that it would matter to product owners and business sponsors. And a couple of problems with the principal plus interest model, the credit card model, is one is that it sounds linear, or at least you know, compound. Um, and it sounds like that the debt is directly a function of the code, um, which means that all technical debt is equal, or equivalent, perhaps. Which means it's just a matter for the development team to sort out. It's nothing to do with the context of the team, or what's going on, or what you're planning to do. But there's a more, um, a less obvious problem, which is that for for people doing normal sort of business side people. Um, the use of the word debt is, suggests that technical decisions and shortcuts are safe and easy to control. So if I borrow so much today, I know what the interest rates are, I can control it, I can see that you know, the payments are going to come through at a particular time and they might go up and down, but it's all very manageable. And you know, in a lot of businesses, debt, yeah, great, I have more of that, because that's where, that's where they, they get some activity. Um, what it doesn't say is, tell you about the sort of situation that we keep, that most of us have experienced, which is you go along, go along, and oh my god, you just drop off a cliff. And that doesn't, the principal plus interest doesn't, care, it doesn't explain, doesn't um, reflect that kind of reality. Um, and that, that whole sort of dynamic thing is, is, is um, you need to be aware of these sort of risks, uh, and that needs, to, that needs to be a product concern. I think the other thing that's um, the theory that I have is, so in the West, or most, most of the world, um, we've lived in a period of low inflation and very low interest rates. I mean, now they practically pay you to 
to hold them, you know, to hold on to uh, negative rate interest rates are almost negative in some areas. So there's a whole generation or two that have grown up with very low interest rates. Whereas Ward, and I'm not f that far behind him, uh, grew up just after a period of some inter interest rates in Britain reached, were getting close to 20%. In the Carter era, yeah, 15, 20%. And when you're in that sort of situation, interest rates are very, very important and right in the you know, front of your face. So I think possibly the, the debt metaphor has lost quite a lot of its impact. Um, but from the non-linear, how many people have heard of Fred Brooks? In this book, The Myth Mythical Man Month, which is a unfortunate title. One. This, this is you should all go out and get your phone. Now you can get your phones out and order that book. Um, it's like I say, it's an unfortunate title of its period, but it's at least 30 years old and it's still a fundamental text in software development. Um, scaling up of software entities necessarily an increase the number of different elements. In most cases, the elements interact with each other in some non-linear fashion, and the complexity of the whole increases much more than linear, which again is the thing that a lot of non-technical people, or sort of non-software people don't get, is this sort of non-linear aspect, where suddenly two or three little things align, and then all of a sudden, things go bang. So we're proposing an alternative metaphor for how to talk to p other people about the concept of technical debt. Um, I would we'll repeatedly emphasize it's a metaphor. It's not a financial model. Uh, it's just a way of talking to people, the re relevant people, just to get the point across. Um, so the sort of things we might want are, we want to talk about value as well as cost, because there is value to carrying debt. That's why people do it, because they get stuff now that they otherwise they'd have to wait for. Uh, we want it to reflect the dynamic nature rather than the static nature of the debt. We want to try and make it relevant to product owners and I should say business owners, uh, business sponsors there as well. And again, finally, to encourage focus on, on active components. Uh, yeah, the product owners thing is we want them, in some sense, although it sounds strange, we want the product owners to take back ownership of technical debt so that they can prioritize between uh, technical debt over building customer features because if they don't understand and they don't have that um, they don't understand the real trade-offs then quite often they'll end up making bad decisions and that's how you get the whole relentless feature 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 only you know and then then it falls off the end so I just want to divert for a minute just to give you a concrete example um, and this, I hope, will make sense in a little while. So in the travel industry, in hotels, let's say, um, there's a thing you can do with a, with a non-refundable deposit. I mean, it happens in all sorts of situations, but let's, let's just stick with hotels. Um, and the idea is, I know I'm going somewhere in, in a period of, you know, in three months' time, um, I can put a deposit down, not pay the whole thing, for a room in a hotel, and I'd turn up and I'd get my room at a price that I fixed today. And then everything's nice and, nice and orderly, the hotel, and the hotel collects the deposit, and that kind of locks things down. Um, now, when that day comes, it might be that things have gone very quiet, and that the hotel rooms are actually a lot cheaper than the price I booked for today, when, when, I, bought my, when I put my deposit down. At which point, the sensible thing to do is just drop the deposit, I've lost it, it's fine, because the hotel rooms are so much cheaper on that day that I should just go and book a room, do a, do a walk-in price. Um, because the deposit doesn't, on my side, I'm not required to use that booking. All I lose is my deposit. Um, now, as you probably guessed, it doesn't take very long before a large institution, or maybe a large hotel, will start to notice that how many people are not turning up and forfeiting their deposits. And that actually, it's a nice little revenue stream for, uh, you know, if you do it steadily. And if you do it right, um, you can start to overbook a bit. Uh, because on the whole, it will all come out in the wash. And then if the occasionally you, you get overbooked by a couple of rooms, that's fine because you call your friend down the street and you move them over there. And it maybe you lose money on that day, but on the whole, it, you know, on the whole you win. 
Um, and then one day, there's a football match. And I use this example because I was traveling to Manchester, and I think there was a city match that day. And I, I got to 20 kilo, about 20 kilometers outside town before I gave up looking for a hotel room uh, that wasn't just bonk, you know, astoundingly expensive. And I just took the train home that night. Um, so you get these, you know, suddenly there are these events. And if you're a hotel and you've been doing the overbooking thing, and, you know, you've been doing quite well, and then the football match happens and you forgot to make previous arrangements with all the other local hotels, you've got a bunch of people that turn up on the day with their contracts, which you have to honour, um, and you haven't got any rooms. And the only rooms left are the super-duper five-star, you know, city centre, whatever it is, um, Shangri-La or whatever it is, and you lose a huge amount of money because you have to house these people on your expense because they have a contract. Uh, now, just hold that f uh, event for me because I'm going to come back to it shortly. I want to talk about one more thing, uh, one more concept, which is the cost of delay. This is a term from a chap called Don Reinertsen, who writes about a lot of this stuff. Um, and this is a way of, again, a way of thinking about things. So the idea is, is that if I can deliver this new feature or change, whatever, if I can deliver it in a month, it's worth 10 million. If I deliver it in two months, it's worth six. Maybe because I've lost a month's worth of revenue or because um, uh, you know, everyone's caught up or I've missed the Christmas rush or something. Anyway, there is a cost of not... Del in, cer in certain situations, that delay will cost you a, a certain amount of money, and that delay is called the cost of delay. So, imagine we have a team, and they can deliver a certain number of units of change with the code in its current state. Uh, and they have these units of change, these new features that they, people want, um, and each unit of change has a cost of delay. So if I can deliver it today, it's worth so much. If I deliver it in three months' time, it's worth a lot less. And the team has a certain capacity for delivering these units of change. And as long as they keep going, that's fine. You know, I mean, as long as that's all, you know, we only need three a month, there's no point in changing anything because there's no more demand, and, that's, and we're going as fast as we need to. But then, you know, people get, things get successful and people want more stuff. And, they start to, and then what happens is the value of reducing that technical debt, the thing that's stopping us from going faster, start the, starts to get more and more... Uh, uh, the value of reducing that becomes, because it becomes higher and higher because we can do more and we can, get, we can, um, we can reduce the cost of delay. And so we end up with uh, this technical debt starts to cost us lots and lots of money. Um, now this shape is, and I have people following so far. I'll just keep going round and round until um, I hope it sort of comes together later on. But this shape is what's known as a call option. The call option, how many people are familiar with the financial markets in any sense? There's a few. So the thing is not to worry about the financial... Don't forget, the financial markets are not some new thing. The Babylonians had futures for... for, uh, for um, it all comes out of agriculture originally. It's just it's more recently it's got out of hand. But this whole... So a call option says, I've got the right... I, I pay you for the right but not the obligation to buy an asset at an agreed price at a point in the future. That's your hotel deposit. So when I put my deposit down, I have the right but not the obligation to turn up and buy a hotel room three months from now. And I guarantee to lose a certain amount of money because I've given you a premium, I've given you a deposit. If on the, on the given day, if the market price is higher than the agreed price, I win because that margin is, um, is what I've gained. If I... If the market price is lower than the strike price, uh, than the, the premium, uh, I've lost a bit, but it's okay because I haven't, I've limited my risk, which is why it's called risk management. And so the payoff is the higher the value on the day, the larger the payoff of the option. 
Um, let's look at it from the other side. So there's value in carrying the debt. So we incurred this debt so we can get some features. Um, so while we're carrying the debt, there is, we've already acquired some value. So same sort of thing. Um, this is how fast we can go. As we start to get slower than we than demand, the value of carrying that debt gets negative, which means we're losing money because we can't deliver as fast as we need to. And so we feel like the graph flips over. And the reason you want to look at that, or I think you want to look at that, is because this is from the sold side. I have sold you an option. I've sold you a hotel booking. I'm the hotel at this point. Um, and what happens is the price is very, you know, again, on the day, the market rate is, is much higher. Everyone's busy. Everyone wants hotel rooms. Um, I'm stuck. Um, I'm losing lots of money at that point. What is this? This is called a short call option because I've sold it. it doesn't, I mean, the terminology doesn't really matter. What matters is at the level we deal with, no one knows what this means unless you're working in, unless you're working in the markets. However, people on the business side, particularly people higher up, will understand this. And if you tell them that you just sold a bunch of short call options, they will go, what? Because in certain situations, the, the risk is unlimited. If you get this really, really wrong, um, you can go broke on this. And any risk management side in a larger organization, if you, if you start banding words around like, we, we just sold a bunch of call options and we haven't hedged them, uh, that will certainly attract some attention. Um, and so what you're trying to explain is that we've done all this stuff, we, you know, we got some benefit from it, but we haven't balanced it uh, with um, what you're supposed to do at this point is what's called hedge it, is you buy a compensating option so that you don't get hit. If you're a hotel, you go and cut a deal with all your neighboring hotels, so if there's a problem, you have someone to go to. Um, so what we've done at this point is we've explained that actually, you know all those shortcuts we took? One day, someone can call us, among, call us on them, and that would be really bad. What do you want to do about this to mitigate the risk? Um, and there's a couple of ways of pu putting this. You can think about this at sort of the portfolio level or whatever. One way I look at it is, and Chris tends to view this as a sort of at the system level, but another way I like to think about this is that like each tiny little decision that you take in the code base, each if statement, each what a switch, whatever, is like a decision, a commitment now. And the premium you get is because you get to release a feature or you get to add a little bit of functionality. Um, and on the whole, it kind of works out, even if it's not great. Um, but it's like, if you like, the, the whole code base is just like this portfolio of, of, of options. Um, and the risk is if there's a sudden shift, that all your options get called at once. So again, you know, we're pottering along nicely. Oh, you do know this is supposed to go into multiple currencies. One currency isn't enough. Oops. Crash. So that's the, that's the thing we're trying to get to, which is that it's not principal first interest. It's a bunch of options because you, suddenly something can happen and you get called. And all of a sudden everything crashes and you didn't prepare. You didn't hedge. You didn't manage the risk. You just took the money. And the thing is, it's not just code. You can get system level debt as well. I mean, there's all sorts of debt. Um, and, you know, I don't know. Anyway, but but just in our little world. So a couple of examples. One thing I, you know, things like using synchronous versus asynchronous uh, messaging or communication. Uh, if you get that wrong, then you lock everything up, um, or you know whatever's appropriate. The one I, I I have seen a lot of is where a system starts as a website. So, so I can't think of that as vertical. And then over time, as it gets successful, people start adding APIs to it. And then all, at some point, you find that the system is actually really a message-based system um, with a bit of website stuck on the top, except you built it that way, and, and the world has gone this way. And again, it's one of those things where crossing from one to the other can be, can be quite tricky. So a metaphor that highlights value as, as well as cost, we get our premiums. So we know that we get some, some value back from, or we should get some value back from making, from making this thing. 
reflects the dynamic nature. I think that's, this is a better way of talking about it um, than just talking about principle and interest because it reflects both the state of the code and the environment it's in and what might be happening in the future. Um, uh, we hope it's relevant to product owners because we're introducing them to concepts of risk um, and their job is to, you know, a lot of organizations don't do risk management, they do risk identification. You know, they write down all these risks that might happen and they don't do anything about it. And this is um, a way of explaining to product owners or you know, business sponsors some of the things that, that might be risky. Um, and, also, and, and it's this thing about looking at a system as it grow, moves over time, not, not just as a snapshot. Um, and one of the things that, that's a little bit thing is, is this, if the product owner is aware of a potential change in an area that has technical debt, it gives us, it, it's a way of talking about what might be coming up. You know, what, where do you have to hedge? Where do you have to compensate? So obviously the first thing any sensible product owner is, is going to say, well, this is so, all sounds very good. What am I supposed to do about this? Um, and there are some things that, that product owners should be supporting directly, you know, with just a sort of raw hygiene. Things like, you know, if, you, if you're making change in a bit of code, clean it up while you're in there, you know, this is all standard stuff. The other one which I think is interesting in this respect is um, the, the support for the development environment. And we see so many organizations where the development environment is, is underinvested. You know, you've got slow machines, I mean, it's not as bad as it used to be in many places, but slow, slow machines or what you see constantly um, in large organizations is that things like the version control is grindingly slow or the, the, uh, if you're forced to use JIRA, the JIRA instance is grindingly slow, and all that kind of stuff. And it just drags everybody down. Or the build is slow, which is the, the classic. Um, there's a colleague of mine many years ago working at a large institution, and his machine was slow, so slow that he measured the hourglass time on his uh, IntelliJ instance. You know, not lost productivity, raw hourglass time. And he worked out that even with um, his their inflated their inflated uh, cross charging rate and his day rate and all the rest of it that they could have, could have bought a new machine in three months based on his hourglass time and took it to his manager and says well that's true but you know nothing I can do anyway it's the sort of thing that product owner can do without changing anything in the system to make things go faster but there's another base risk based thing uh, uh, approach to, to uh, technical debt. So one of the things is looking at the cost of delay for upcoming features. Um, thinking about, these, these are reasons that you might want to do it. It's, you've got upcoming features that where you can start to think about the cost of delay. Uh, reduction of lead time. The, how, how many people are familiar with the Accelerate book? I should have written it down. There's a few people. There's, there's this report coming out of California about high performance organizations. Um, Nicole Forsgen or something, Forsgen. Um, anyway, the, um, and one of the characteristics they have of high-performing organizations is uh, short lead time. So you can, you know, if you can, these are the sort of things you want to promote, reduction in lead time. And then again, just sort of standard old school, trying to reduce the probability of production bug. If you've got something that's already a bit flaky, um, the chances are it's where that's where the future flakiness is going to be. Now, all this, these kind of discussions involve a degree of sophistication on the part of your product people and, op and an open attitude. Um, and it also takes a degree of reflection and maturity about talking about the current state. But uh, here's a metaphor. And, uh, whoops, come back. I suspect we're going to see more of these, but uh, anyway. The interesting thing about the current the hurricane map is it's got this thing, this what they call the cone of uncertainty. Does this work? It doesn't matter. It's got this thing called the cone of uncertainty. So we're pretty sure where it's going to be for the next half day, you know, and then maybe this is a day. And there should be a scale around here, yeah. 
Um, and then as thing, you know, this is where it might be and further out. We're not, we're not so certain. Um, but it does give us a general, a general direction. And if we've done our homework, we will already know which are the most vulnerable parts of the coastline um, and the ones we have to worry about most. Um, and we can sort of monitor appropriately um, and, do the, and do, do the appropriate warnings. And then, of course, as time changes, the map is continuously updated um, so that you know, you, you, you know, the, the, the uncertainty disappears the closer you get. Now, in the old school, sort of agile, people used to claim, I can take this code wherever I want to go. But in practice, again, except in except, uh, highly unusual circumstances, on the whole, pretty much everyone knows where they're going. They know what the likely roadmap is going to be. Um, so let's do a hurricane map. This is rather big for me. Uh, for some code, and just walk this through. Um, so here's a number of features that we want, um, coded in terms of, I might have that the wrong way around, immediate to far out, to f f far away. So we're definitely going to do this. This is the next thing on the list. This is probably coming up. Maybe we do the Chinese thing. Who knows? Um, here are some components named after towns in Manchester. That's a separate issue. And we pretty much know kind of how bad they are. We can stick a, do a rough guess. 10 minutes. Um, and we put some sort of numbers on them. And most teams can do this without a great deal of effort. Um, and so you'll see that this one Cheadle is pretty good. Um, Ardwick is kind of medium. This one, Berry, it's pronounced Berry, is an absolute train wreck. It's, five, it's going to take us 500 days to fix, and, and so on. And you can kind of look at this, and you can start to make some, uh, some observations, which is, um, we're about to start working on this one anyway. Why don't we just fix it, clean, you know, clean it up? Particularly as we know there's more coming down the pipe. Um, similar sort of thing here. We can probably defer this a bit, but we need to allow a bit more time to clean this one up when we get there. Uh, and then this one is quite bad, but we're not going to touch it to here. However, when we do get here, if we suddenly find we have to make, take 100 days off before we can do anything useful at all, that's not very really good. So maybe we should allocate a bit of time here to sort of preemptively to start to clean up the mess so that when we get down to here, we're in a much safer position. Um, and same sort of thing. I should, I should chop one of these off. Um, the code, if you just did your code analysis, static code analysis, that would say, you really have to fix this. This is your biggest hole. But actually, it's one of those um, red components. It's not going anywhere. You know, it's probably you know, some ancient thing sitting on an AS400 in a, in a whatever. You know, no one knows what it's going to do. You know, it's just not changing. So there's no point in touching that at all. Uh, in fact, probably the best thing to do if you ever need to change it is do a complete rewrite. Um, and it's this sort of planning based on risk uh, and a little bit of look ahead and thinking about the consequences and reacting, preparing well in time, which is actually risk management, rather than saying, this one's really bad, at least we've written it down. Um, blah, 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 blah. And there are some interesting approaches now. Um, there's a chap called Adam Thornhill, I think he's written a book called um, Code as a, Crime, as a Crime Scene. And um, he's, got, uh, he's got a product, associated product out now, which is looking much more in terms of dynamic, looking at, uh, and there's, there, there is a sort of schools of research about this, looking in terms of um, how code changes over time and hotspots and all that kind of stuff. And then finally, the other thing you can do with this is you can do the same thing if, if this was um, uh, s staff debt. is like, it turns out that um, this thing is written in Turbo Pascal or some obscure 4GL that no one uses anymore. And it's going to take you 100 days to train somebody up to, to, to do anything useful in that. Again, uh, it's risk mitigation. Is you can say, I know this is coming. I don't really want to do all of it now, but I can start to prepare a bit. Um, whereas, you know, this is standard Java Spring. Everybody knows that. There's no problem. Um, or 
this one's in an obscure domain. Code is pretty straightforward, but nobody understands that particular logic because it's a very obscure kind of highly regulated thing that people need to know. So you can use the same sort of thing thinking about the team as well as the code. So, just to finish, um, it's about thinking about uh, technical debt as a risk management rather than um, just the raw sort of credit card payment and interest. Um, and that, because one of the things, where it's a way of looking at the system, where it is now and where it's been, where it's come from and where it's going, Think, looking at it dynamically. Um, and it's also about getting our point across to certain people in a way that might attract the kind of attention it deserves or that, that it needs, perhaps. Um, because otherwise we're just a bunch of moaning techies who don't really understand the business. And finally, it's just a metaphor. Um, this is not a plan for a scientific method for accurately pricing code bases. It's a metaphor, it's a way of talking about things. And that's it. Thank you very much.